Hey everybody, this is Christine. This is my attempt at uh, class since we got snowed out again. I, I've already recorded this class four times, but um, I have had difficult technical difficulties a few times, and then I realized that I kind of sounded like the teacher from Ferris Bueller, 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 because I was really <laughs> tired. So I'm trying to uh, to re-record this. Hopefully, I sound a little more peppy than I did. We're going to talk about immunity and that is the concept 20 in Giddens textbook. I added some slides so I and uploaded them to Blackboard as well so if you can please take a look at the new slides that are on there um, you'll be able to follow along a little easier. Goals for this concept, to define and describe the concept, notice risk factors for altered immune functioning. You need to recognize when an individual, your patient, has altered immune functioning and you need to be able to provide nursing care and collaborative interventions for your patient that will help optimize their immune function and minimize any complications. Immunity is simply the normal physiologic response to microorganisms and proteins as well as conditions associated with an inadequate or excessive immune response. I'm sorry, I was just talking to my son. What is meant by altered immunity? There are... So, <clears throat> there are um, two ends of the spectrum. You can have an individual that is immunocompromised and their immune system is not working efficiently for a variety of reasons and there also can be called immuno, that can also be termed an immunodeficiency. And then at the other end of the spectrum you can have an individual whose immune system is in hyperactive hyperdrive and will not shut down. Either one is not good. Both cause risk factors. Um, both cause organ damage, both can cause um, difficulties for your patient, and both are, are something that you really need to be aware of. And in a normal healthy um, individual, a normal healthy patient, you have a balance between the exaggerated immune response and the suppressed immune response. And that is the, your optimal immune response. <coughs> this is a collaborative learning activity, but unfortunately we don't have collaborative. So we're going to just review the terms of innate immunity, active acquired immunity, and passive acquired immunity. And um, innate, innate immunity is what you are already, your body already possesses as a barrier to infection, like your skin, um, your mucous membranes, your tears. And active acquired immunity is any time that your body develops immunity after being exposed to an infection. Each time your body is exposed to an infection, it remembers that pathogen a little more quickly than the, the last time. In a similar way, where you have a group of soldiers that have encountered an enemy force, and the first time that they encounter them, they may not be able to they may not be able to recognize them as an enemy. They may not have a good feel of if that enemy force, <laughs> what their strengths and weaknesses are. But the next time they encounter them, they'll have had the benefit of the experience and hopefully remember that and do better against the en that enemy force. Similar way when your immune system encounters an organism that's not supposed to be there, the first time it may be slow to react, but the second, third, fourth time it, it reacts much more quickly. And then in passive acquired immunity, you have a situation in which um, you are, your body has not really earned the immunity. It's been given to you either through something like intravenous immunoglobulin 
or breast milk or immunity that's been passed to a baby from their mother in utero. My son's going to ask me a question. Yes, Ted. Actually, I wanted to state a little um, factoid that people have been having theories of. Uh -huh. um, they theorize that um, people that live in clean environments, such as homes and stuff, actually have less things that they're immune to. So they have more allergies later on because the body doesn't know how to react when they meet these new substances. And here you have my extremely bright and handsome son adding a few words for you. Okay, um, the next slide shows what happens when a pathogen enters your body. It enters here at the site of infection. The microbe comes in. The lymphatic vessel... Um, the, I'm sorry, the white blood cells in the lymphatic vessel recognize it. They put up a, they distribute an antigen. The antigen is transported in the lymphatic um, vessel and lymphocytes recognize it as being foreign and start traveling to the site of infection. Then there is a um, cascading reaction and more and more lymphocytes come to the site they start differentiating between different types of cells killer cells killer T cells that um, directly attack the, the infection memory T cells that will remember that pathogen the next time <clears throat> um, any factor T cells that are responsible for killing or, excuse me, killing the um, pathogen. The effector C cells in, in the antibodies enter circulation. The memory lymphocytes enter circulation and um, take up the memory lymphocytes take up resident in normal tissues in preparation for the next infection. And the effector T cells and antibodies enter into the tissue and eliminate the antigen. So it's a multi-pronged approach. In reviewing the immune system, you have what's called the major histocompatibility complex. It's basically a, f a protein that acts as a scout in your immune system. It goes through and marks anything that it detects as being foreign and then um, forwards that information to your white blood cell and the rest of your immune system and th that allows your body to identify um, this is one of the ways your body can identify foreign um, antigens. You have uh, several organs involved in immune response in your body and they are part of your lymph system and a variety of cells associated with immune response. And I think this following video does a good job of explaining it and I'm going to go ahead and play it for you. The lymphatic system. Lymph vessels are found in all tissues except the central nervous system the bone marrow, and tissues without blood vessels such as cartilage. The lymph system vessels are extensive as the vessels of the circulatory system. The lymphatic system serves several functions. It controls fluid balance by draining and cleansing the fluids that leave the circulatory system to deliver nutrients and gases to the tissues. It interacts with the villi in the digestive system to absorb and deliver fats to the circulatory system. It also has an immunological protection from viruses, bacteria, fungi, and cellular debris that could damage the cells of the body. From your understanding of the circulatory system, you know that the blood passes through the arteries, arterioles, and then the capillaries. The capillary walls allow the fluid portion of the blood to exit the capillaries into the surrounding tissues. Once the fluid leaves the capillaries, it is called interstitial fluid. About 90% of this fluid will diffuse back into the capillaries because of the difference in concentrations of the fluid. However, about 10% of the fluid will enter the open-ended lymph vessels. Once the fluid has entered the lymph vessels, it's now called lymph. These vessels eventually deliver the lymph to locations where the lymph can be cleansed of debris and checked for the presence of pathogenic organisms. How it gets the lymph there is pretty amazing. There is no heart for this system of vessels to pump the lymph around. 
So how does a limp get to the locations it needs to be delivered to? The limp moves through your body when you move your skeletal muscles. The contraction of skeletal muscles squeezes the nearby lymph vessels, pumping them. This pushes lymph through the vessels. In addition to the contraction of skeletal muscles, there are two other means by which lymph travels through the lymphatic system. There are smooth muscles at the larger lymph vessels. The contraction of these smooth muscles adds to the force provided by the skeletal muscles. Also, when we breathe, pressure changes occur in the thoracic region. When the thoracic pressure drops, that tends to pull lymph into the thoracic duct. One-way valves prevent the lymph from flowing backwards. The function of fluid balance is seen best, perhaps, when it goes awry. When the lymphatic system is prevented from doing its job, the fluids build up in the tissues. Edemas is the term given to this medical condition. Mild edema can occur during pregnancy when the weight of the baby slows the ability of the vessels to move the lymph up the body. More serious levels of edema can occur in a tropical disease called elephantitis in which a parasite blocks the vessels and the edema that is produced looks a lot like having legs of an elephant. Some lymph tissue is very diffuse with no clear boundaries. You can actually feel some when you rub your lower inner lip with your tongue. Others are more organized into groups, and these are called lymph nodes. Lymph nodes have three functions. First, they are testing stations. They monitor the blood by receiving samples of the blood plasma. Second, if the sample is rife with foreign invaders, they produce lymphocytes and send them into the bloodstream to try to destroy those invaders. In addition, the lymph nodes filter the lymph that they have so they can only return clean fluid back to the blood. Eventually, the lymph is returned to the circulatory system via the right and the left subclavian veins in the shoulders just above the heart level. Lymph nodules can be found as single structures in the body, or they can be grouped together in small clumps. That's what the tonsils are. They're groups of lymph nodules under the mucous membrane in the throat. These lymph nodules form a protective ring around the throat strategically located to protect the body from foreign invaders. If the tonsils get infected, they can become inflamed and abnormally enlarged, as you see here. This condition is called tonsillitis. If the condition is chronic, the tonsils can be removed in a tonsillectomy. Tonsils tend to get smaller as a person matures, and they can actually disappear altogether in an adult. Peyer's patches are very similar to tonsils. They are groups of lymphocytes and lymph nodules that are in the small intestines. Typically, they're found in the last third of the small intestine. Once again, they're strategically located to deal with foreign invaders. The lymphatic system's second function takes place here in the small intestine as well, the absorption of fats. We will discuss this more in depth in the topic of digestion, but for now, know that there are specialized lymph vessels called lacteals in the intestinal villi. These pick up fats that are released from digested food and absorb it into the villus tissue. The liquid in the vessels take on a milky color. Instead of being called limp, this fluid is called chyle. The chyle eventually gets dumped in the subclavian vein, just like limp. That is how the fats enter the circulatory system. The spleen is a significant lymphatic structure and has a lot in common with the smaller nodes throughout the body. But unlike the lymph nodes, the spleen does not filter lymph. It's part of the lymphatic system, however, because it filters the blood. As the blood passes through the white pulp of the spleen, foreign invaders stimulate a response from the diffuse lymphatic tissue or the lymph nodules. The spleen also works to clean the blood of worn-out erythrocytes. Remember, red blood cells have a short lifespan. As a result, roughly 2 million erythrocytes die every second. They must be removed from the blood, and that's another job of the spleen. Before the blood leaves the spleen through the veins, it passes through the red pulp. Macrophages in the red pulp engage in phagocytosis to remove both foreign invaders and worn-out red blood cells. The third function of the spleen is to act as a reservoir for oxygen-rich blood. The spleen actually holds more blood than is necessary for its own metabolism. Therefore, it's an extra blood supply full of oxygen and nutrients. This serves as a backup supply of blood in case of blood loss. If the body detects blood loss due to hemorrhage, the sympathetic division of the ANS stimulates the smooth muscles in the capsule of the spleen to contract. This pushes the backup supply of blood into the bloodstream, compensating for the blood loss. Although the backup supply of blood in the human spleen is rather minor, it's a major factor in the physiology of some other mammals. Seals use the spleen as a built-in oxygen tank. 
When the seal dives, it conserves its oxygen as much as possible. However, when it's running low and cannot get to the surface, the smooth muscles of the spleen contract, sending the oxygen-rich blood stored there into the bloodstream. This gives the seal more time before it must surface to breathe. Although the spleen is part of the lymphatic system, you can live without it. If your spleen is ruptured due to an injury, it can be removed in a splenectomy. This is often necessary in order to stop internal bleeding because the spleen is so vascular. Once your spleen is removed, tissues in the liver as well as other lymphatic tissues in the body take over the first two tasks of the spleen. Of course, the overall function is not as good as when the spleen was present in the body. As a result, people who have their spleens removed are more susceptible to infections and more sensitive to hemorrhage. The spleen is roughly the size of a clenched fist. Unlike lymph nodes, however, the capsule, or outer cover of the spleen, contains smooth muscle tissue. Extensions of this capsule, called trabeculae, make up the skeleton of the node. The lymph nodes are fed by several afferent lymph vessels. However, lymph exits through just one efferent lymph vessel. Reticular fibers extend from the trabeculae, forming a net of connective tissue throughout the lymph node. Inside the spleen, there are two types of tissue, red pulp and white pulp. The white pulp is composed of diffuse lymphatic tissue and lymph nodules, much like the lymph node. This white pulp surrounds the arteries which enter the spleen. The red pulp is made of twisted veins and reticular fibers which are full of blood cells which were in the capillaries of the spleen. Lymph nodules contain germinal centers where rapid mitosis of lymphocytes can take place in response to foreign invaders found in the lymph. Lymphocytes produced in the germinal centers are released into the lymph and eventually reach the bloodstream where they can be transported to the tissues. Another lymphatic system structure is the thymus gland. Like the tonsils, the thymus gland changes as a person matures. When a person is young, the thymus gland is large in proportion to the body size. During this stage of life, it is mostly lymphatic tissue. After puberty, it decreases in size and becomes mostly fibrous and fatty tissue. What does the thymus gland do? Like many things in the human body, the scientific community is still rather puzzled by the thymus gland. We know that while a person is young, immature lymphocytes, known as T-lymphocytes, leave the bone marrow. Remember, blood cells are made in the bone marrow, and they travel to the thymus. The remarkable maturation process, sometimes referred to as thymic education, T-lymphocytes that are beneficial to the immune system are spared, while T-lymphocytes that might evoke a detrimental immunological response are eliminated. For example, if you have type A blood, T lymphocytes which attack the A antigen are destroyed. However, T lymphocytes which attack the B antigen are allowed to mature and enter the bloodstream. Notice that this one is called a gland. That means that one of its functions is to secrete hormones, making it also a part of the endocrine system as well as the lymphatic system. It produces hormones. Principal among them is the hormone thymosin. What does thymosin in the body do? Well, we're not really sure. We know that it affects the immunological response of the body. However, the way that it's done remains unclear. One prevalent thought is that thymosin stimulates the activity of lymphocytes to migrate to other lymphatic tissues. Hey, hopefully you liked the video. I thought it was pretty easy to understand and um, well put together. And I am not where I'm supposed to be here. Let me go back to the correct screen. All right. All right. So this is just a restatement. This slide's just a restatement of what we are. We just learned. Um, you have the bone marrow that has lymphoid lymphoid stem cell. And this lymphoid stem cell can go to one of two places, either the thymus or the bone marrow. If it goes to the thymus, it will become an immunocompetent T cell. And it can further specialize into a T regulatory cell, a cytotoxic T cell, or a memory T cell. And if it goes to the bone marrow, it becomes a B cell. So B for bone, T for thymus. And the B cell 
um, once it's introduced to antigen, um, will um, further can further divide into a memory B cell and a plasma cell. And um, <coughs> we'll move on here. The immune system is not as simple as you might think. Sim simply, it's formed of two main groups of cells. The immune cells that are located in the tissue, which are known as tissue histocytes, and their supportive cells, and the immune cells that are located in the bloodstream, which are known as white blood cells. What are antigens? Antigens are foreign cells that attack the human body, including bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. Basically, they are toxic enemies of our bodies. Histocytes, or phagocytic histocyte cells, act as the primary line of defense against the antigens because they are the fighting units of our immune system to react to the site of foreign antigens. There are several different types of histocytes, including um, phagocytes. Phagocytes are white blood cells that eat and digest invading pathogens. And once T, B, and killer cells mark or render the invading germ incapacitated, it's time for phagocytes to come in and clear up the mess. There are different kinds of phagocytes, including macrophages, neutrophils, and monocytes. Some phagocytes seek out and eat pathogens that have been marked by your antibodies. A type of phagocyte is a macrophage, and there are can be termed the main infantry units of your immune system. They kill any foreign antigen by eating them in a process called phagocytosis. They're a large cell in comparison to the rest of your blood cells. And dendritic cells, they act kind of like intelligence units to gather information about the attacking enemy or the antigen and send this information to the central uh, command of the immune system. The main fighting force in your blood, or in your body, the white blood cells, again, are differentiated into neutrophils. Well, are several different types of white blood cells, I'm sorry. One of which is neutrophils, and they are kind of like the armored unit of your immune system. They are quite similar to tissue macro macrophages, but they have a much better function and performance. Their main function is to fight bacteria especially um, pyogenic ones, which form pus during infection. So if doctor is trying to figure out what kind of infection your patient has, if it's a viral infection or a bacterial infection, they may do a complete blood cell count and ask for a differential. The differential will have the lab technician count the different types of white blood cells and if the neutrophils are elevated, the doctor will suspect a bacterial infection. This is called neutrophilia. Asonophils are another type of white blood cells. They're best described as logistic units, which carry ammunition and supply to the fighting immune system, immune cells. They're secret chemical substances known as cytokines and interleukins that make the blood vessels at the site of the infection much wider so as to bring more blood supply, so they dilate it. These cytokines are also attracted to white blood cells in a phenomenon known as chemotaxis. I'm sorry, taxis. I never can pronounce that. I'm sorry. What this means is that there's an attraction of the white blood cells to the site of the infection. When isonophils turn crazy and stop turning, deciding to turn off, they start to secrete endless cytokines, attracting white blood cells to normal body cells. And that is what um, happens in autoimmune disease. For example, lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. We're going to touch on that a little bit more. But you should know that asonophilia leads to an inflammatory response, including redness, hotness, edema, and pain. It's checked when a, a doctor suspects a rheumatoid um, disease or an autoimmune disease. 
Lymphocytes are another type of white blood cell, and they con can be considered second in command. They have um, a journey where they start it again if they start at the thymus, and um, or and I'm sorry, let me <laughs> re retract. Um, a f remarkable phenomenon occurs as they leave uh, the bone marrow. They can either go to the thymus and become T cells again, or they can go to the um, stay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so tired. All right, let's try that again. So lymphocytes can either be B or T cells, and they can differentiate if they go to the thymus, they're T cells. If they go to the bone marrow, they are um, B lymphocytes. B lymphocytes mature in the intestine, go on uh, to mature in cells that secrete a number of different proteins, and T lymphocytes mature in the thymus. And they not only organize many immune functions, but they also are a major factor in protecting us against the development of cancer. <laughs> there are something called CD8 T lymphocytes. These cells are best described as the special forces units of the immune system. They're like the Navy SEALs of your immune system. Their primary function is to attack viruses, tuberculosis, and sometimes of fungus. They kill their enemies by injecting them with lethal substances, forcing their DNA to break down in a phenomenon known as cell-mediated cytotoxicity. And if you are interested, there's a little t three minute video here on exactly how that works. It's pretty remarkable. You have your helper, helper T cells that are best described as the central command of your army. And there are very, they, T helper cells are the very secret various types of chemicals that regulate the function or th of the immune system and fighting back against attacking enemies. HIV attacks these cells, it destroys them, leaving the immune system without a central command and leading to the failure of the immune system to fight back. This make I'm oh, sorry, this makes the patient infected with HIV virus with weak immune resistance and higher incidence of infection. So it's the soldiers don't have anyone telling them what to do and they can't figure out how to do it on their own. They need a leader and that's when the HIV takes away the helper T cells function, then it leaves your body helpless. Here's a general overview of the immune system. I'm going to have you watch it if you're having any questions about where the various types of white blood cells fit in, but we're going to move on. When you have a suppressed immune response in immunodeficiency, it can be one of two reasons. You can either have a primary immunodeficiency because you were born with some kind of genetic um, maladap maladaption. You had either deleted gene or an added gene that makes your body um, not respond correctly to infection. Or you might have a secondary immunodeficiency where in which it could be intentional. For example, if you had severe rheumatoid arthritis or lupus and your doctor gave you medication to stop your immune system from attacking you. An example would be Humira, methotrexate, steroids. Or it could simply be an adverse effect of treatment if you had... Um, chemotherapy or radiation to kill cancer cells. Unfortunately, one of the side effects is it doesn't just kill the cancer cells, it also kills all of your other good cells. This is a video that helps differentiate between primary and secondary immunodeficiency. If you'd like to watch it, you can pause this uh, presentation and watch, do so, but I'm going to move on. So you have consequences of suppressed immune response. The two major are infection and cancer. And infection is an issue because your body can either doesn't recognize the invaders or cannot put up an adequate response to the invaders. And cancer is an issue 
because your body doesn't recognize that the mutated cells in your body are an issue and instead allows the cells to continue to mutate and spread. In both cases, th is, this is allowed to occur because you have some kind of deficit in your immune system. There are several risk factors for impaired immune function. We're going to, um, I'm sorry, I should have had that in the right order. I don't think I had it, but <clears throat> the risk factors for immune function would be if you had a poor diet, they have shown that a lack in vitamin A and D does affect your immune function. If you have risk factors such as se risky sexual behavior, HIV drug use, excuse me, HIV drug use, IV drug use, um, yeah, you're injecting HIV into yourself. Lots of people do that. And um, if you're exposed to chemicals, especially toxic metals like lead, all of those things can impair your immune function. And actually, just having a high level of stress in your life releases, um, will have your body produce a lot of cortisol, and cortisol does have a negative effect on your ability, your body's ability to fight infection. <coughs> there may be obvious indications in your patient that they have an imp suppressed immune functioning or it may be more subtle. Vital signs can or cannot be, or may or may not be within normal parameters, just depends on their age and how badly their immune system is suppressed. The individual will probably not look well. They will appear um, that they aren't, haven't been eating well. They may have a weight loss or wasting syndrome, and they may complain of general fatigue. They're just, they may tell you, I'm always tired. I'm not hungry. They have impaired wound healing, something that should be a minor um, scratch or cut, just that won't heal and, and may end up um, getting further infected and spreading to the surrounding area. You may find that your patient has opportunistic infections like thrush or mold, yeast, that um, keep reoccurring in women. Often they have recurrent yeast infections. They have a res inflammation and infection within the central nervous system um, may cause a change in the cognitive function in your patient. They may, the family may report that they're not themselves or that they may be depressed. And the presence of seizure activity or changes in motor behavior should also be determined. If any of these symptoms are present in your patient, you need to discuss your concerns with the physician and uh, ask if they can do a workup on their immune function. Sorry, she's just talking to my son. All right. And this is just a review of what I just told you about. They may have enlarged lymph nodes too. I didn't mention that when you palpate under their neck or under their arms. <coughs> and in your role as a nurse, you should monitor their immune function, encourage good nutrition, prevent opportunistic infections with a extremely diligent hand washing. If they're very immunocompromised, the doctor may order reverse isolation, and that just means that you gown, glove, mask, not to protect yourself from the infect from any infection as much as to protect your patient from your germs. And one example would be if you have a patient that's had a bone marrow transplant. Of course, you monitor and treat the opportunistic infections with uh, usually with IV antibiotics or IV um, fungal medications and drug therapy. Just a side note, with when you are giving IV medication for a fungal infection, 
your patient, you will notice, will definitely have more side effects um, than an IV medication given for bacteria. And that is just because the uh, fungus cell wall or fungus and proteins are a more, little more similar to our own um, blood cells and the does and because of that the medication will do damage to both to the infection and to um, the patient's um, tissues and so it's it's just kind of the same um, concept as when you give chemotherapy but to a much less degree it doesn't just kill what's bad it also will affect the tissue the healthy tissue in your patient so they often are just pretty miserable they especially have a lot of GI symptoms all right let's move on to what an exaggerated immune response looks like this is the opposite end of the spectrum and you may find that your patient has anything from a runny nose sneezing watery eyes to rashes swelling and shock the clinical manifestations of autoimmune disorders are very vague um, often and they're not as obvious uh, when but they may be even when they're affecting multiple organs and systems they're not as obvious symptoms may become apparent when the symptoms systems become Im impacted for example if you have inflammation in your cardiovascular system patient may develop pericarditis congestive heart failure pulmonary or a peripheral edema and anemia Renal symptoms can range from no symptoms to glomular nephritis and from acute to chronic renal failure and end-stage renal disease. Musculoskeletal manifestations can include joint pain or the inability to control movements. Some autoimmune disorders do have classic findings. For example, there is a subtle butterfly rash across the nose and cheek common in systemic lupus. <coughs> You have four types of exaggerated immune response. Hypersensitive reactions, which are localized in nature, and systemic effects. And I will review them here on this next slide. In type 1, typical manifestations include systemic anaphylaxis and localized anaphylaxis. In type 2, you have typical manifestations like blood transfusion reactions, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Type 3, you have typical manifestations including arthritis reaction and serum sickness, necrotizing vasculitis, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. And type 4, you have manifestations like dermatitis, lesions, and graft rejection. And just for you to realize that there are degrees of severity, that's really what you need to know. What are the consequences? They can range from anything from a localized effect like a swollen finger from a splinter to a systemic effect, like an anaphylactic reaction. If your immune system doesn't get turned off, after a period of weeks to months, you will develop chronic body-wide disease and your body will start destroying its own body tissue. It could start having an effect on your organ systems and even change the organ function. It's very, it can be very serious. Some symptoms are allergic symptoms, pain, fatigue, and fever. They're, the pain is due to the inflammation the fatigue, they're not entirely sure why, other than it could be just a side effect of the ramped up. It is a side effect of the ramped up immune system, but they're not exactly sure what the process is for that. And then fever. Um, fever can have benefits. You don't want your patient's fever to get too high because it can break down the proteins in your patient's body. 
but it does help um, speed up the when you have a fever your me metabolic rate does speed up and that helps crank out more white blood cells the cytokine production um, helps your direct more white blood cells to the site of the infection. So it is good to allow your patient to have a low grade fever as long as they are not having adverse effects like increase in heart rate or increase in respiratory rate that, that is affecting them too adversely. <coughs> okay. Here's a patient with allergic rhinitis or sin sinusitis. And just you can see all the inflammation in his sinuses. This is two people that have had an anaphylactic reaction. You can note the rash and the inflammation on the lips. This inflammation usually extends through the airway. This poor woman here is even more severe. You can't even recognize what she might look like. In an anaphylactic reaction, you want to give epinephrine. Um, you give it IM in an EpiPen usually, and you leave the EpiPen in place for 10 seconds and withdraw it. And your patient will go, like, get really shaky and excited after the injection. It's just a side effect of the epinephrine. It's to be expected. Here's a rash present in an anaphylactic reaction. If your patient has um, an exaggerated inflammatory response, something that will help in an acute response is rice, and that is rest, ice, compression, and elevation. And you want to have this the in the first 24 to 48 hours typically is when this uh, intervention helps the most. You have icing of the sprain or strain for 20 minutes at a time every two to three hours. Leave the ice in place for a longer period and you can cause additional tissue damage. Um, I had somebody leave an ice pack on place for my mom's foot and it caused a first degree burn, frost or first degree frostbite on her foot. <clears throat> You can have compression of the damaged area can sometimes help, but if it's too tight, you can give your patient compartment syndromes. You need to be checking your patient's fingers and toes, make sure they have good cap refill, good skin turgor, good warmth, good color. And whenever possible, try to elevate their leg or their extremity above the level of the heart. That helps minimize swelling. When you have a patient that um, has had an exaggerated immune response, if you can identify what the antigen is or the, that is causing an issue for your patient, then you, obviously you need to remove that from the um, environment. For example, if someone with a peanut allergy needs to be you know, very careful about any food with peanuts, there is also some cross reaction with different other other nuts, and not only that, you they may be so severe that they can't even go anywhere that has a peanuts. They can't go to a grocery store. They can't work with anyone that's eating a peanut butter sandwich. There was a case a couple years ago of a teenage girl that died from anaphylaxis when her boyfriend ate a peanut butter sandwich and kissed her, and she, it was known that she had anaphylaxis anaphylactic reaction to peanuts but uh, obviously her boyfriend didn't mean to kill this poor girl but so you just education is a key in um, keeping your patient safe airway support and if anaphylaxis occurs they may not start out with wheezing it usually is a slower process so they may just get a little itching in their throat then they start um, not being able to talk as the swelling increases and then they may develop wheezing and <coughs> um, difficulty breathing and this can occur anywhere from several minutes even a half an hour to a matter of a minute or less 
depending on the severity of the um, allergy. You want to give them antihistamines like Benadryl, um, immunosuppressive therapy if the patient has a bad enough um, allergy, for example, to peanuts, the doctor might put them on a steroid or something to depress their immune system. And anti-inflammatory agents, relief of, the, relief of the symptoms with Benadryl for itching or some other kind of antihistamine. Decongestion like Sudafed and analgesics, usually Tylenol or Motrin is sufficient. Okay, we already talked about this. How do you recognize overall you need to get a good medical history? Ask your patient about their family history, genetic history. For example, African American women have a higher incidence of lupus. They're 10 times more likely to develop lupus. What their current medications are. Many medications may uh, have a side effect of depress depressing the immune system. If they have allergies to medications or other substances, there's a lot of cross sensitivity. For example, if you're allergic to um, cephalosporins, sometimes you also have a problem when you take ampicillin. Lifestyle behaviors, anything that puts you at high risk for developing immune disorders like HIV, your occupation, anything where you're exposed to heavy metals, and your social environment. The poor have a higher risk of developing immune disorders because they don't have good access to good health care and because just the stress of being poor increases your cortisol level um, and it can have an adverse re effect on your immune system. The doctor may order right um, a CBC to check for red blood cell and white blood cell count, C-reactive protein, ESR. C-reactive protein is used, it's a general test. It uses, um, is used to determine inflammation in the body, but it can't diagnose the disease. It just tells the physician if inflammation is present. And uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate is another example that is just a generalized um, test. It doesn't give specific information. It just is kind of like um, the start of the investigation. <coughs> rheumatoid factors are checked if the doctor is suspecting any kind of rheumatic disorder like rheumatoid arthritis um, psoriatic arthritis the western blot test and the illicit test are used to check for HIV torch antibody panel is used to check for cytomegalovirus, herpes rubella and toxoplasmosis and organ function tests that are more specific like the A1C for diabetes hepatic function or thyroid screening panels might be checked. The best treatment is prevention. Encourage your patients to get immunizations. Encourage them and educate them about avoiding high risk. Encourage them to avoid high risk behaviors and educate them about the consequences of high risk behaviors. Ensure that they have resources for to link them with for adequate nutrition if they do not have adequate nutrition, for example, WIC, food stamps, the local food bank. Encourage them to take uh, A A&D supplements. Exercise and infection control measures hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. You would not believe how bad healthcare professionals are about washing their hands. You should wash your hands before you go in the room, after you leave the room, before you touch your patient. If you touch your patient and then touch something else in the room, you should wash your hands again. It is absolutely critical that you wash your hands. Uh, being able to apply personal protective equipment, um, using a gown cap, isolation precautions when they're ordered. You see a lot of people get lazy and maybe 
skip wearing gloves when someone's in isolation or skip the gown just for a second they're going to go in there a second is all it takes for that bacteria or that organism to settle on the healthcare workers clothes and then when you leave that room you spread it to your other patients maintaining a sterile environment when you do any kind of procedure is key when you collect specimens for culture you need to do everything in your power to make sure that you have maintained a sterile environment if you, to get that specimen whether it's a urine culture or a blood culture if you don't maintain sterility of that ster or that sterile field and you send a specimen and it comes back as being contaminated i feel you know you're directly responsible for prolonging that patient's hospital stay because you were too either incompetent or just lazy and to make sure that you correctly gathered that sterile field or ex correctly gathered that uh, specimen so you absolutely should maintain sterile field and practice that if you're not good at it it is something that you need to practice and then of course medicating your patient appropriately <clears throat> there are no routine screenings for the general population but there is screening for HIV in specific high-risk behaviors And um, this is just an exemplar in your learning group. Identify and discuss common conditions linked to suppressed or examined, exaggerated immune responses. I'll help you out with some here. Suppressed immune response, you could have um, HIV. Let's see. Um, chemotherapy. Uh, or cancer. Exaggerated immune response, you would have lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, um, glomular nephritis. All right, that's the end of the presentation. Hopefully, I was a little more peppy than my last four recordings. And if not, well, I'm not going to do it again. But if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you.